Hi, we're delighted to have you here. And I've just been thinking these last few days about the amazing adventure of my life. And here, uh, I am 84 years old, and I know when I got to be 80, I suddenly was aware of the fact that I wouldn't live forever. Most of you young people, why well, you don't think about death, but when you think about that, that brings into picture everything. At least it has in my life. I think from my very childhood, I was always more curious than most about getting answers to the ultimate questions of life. What is life all about? Why are we here? What about the cosmos? And now in recent years, we've expanded our knowledge so much. Well, our, our telescopes have reached out a light years distance. We find that there's not only other planets like ours, there must be thousands, millions of them. And we can't imagine that they're all out there and there's nobody living on them. And on the other hand, when we probe the sky, and I've talked with the people con con uh, out in California that had their radio telescopes that have been searching for some message from space, and there's, no, there's nothing. It seems like we're all alone, and still there must, there must be more. And then, of course, there are the many, many different religions we have on our planet. And before I go into that, I want to mention one thing. I was founder of Earth Day, and I believe the two items that can do the most for people and planet are the celebration of Earth Day on nature's great event, the March Equinox, and the adoption of the Earth Trustee Ideal. If people all over the world got excited about the fact that we have an amazing planet and we know that there is, are the natural resources, we have everything from gold to oil, we, we have uh, all kind of life, we're just beginning to understand the extent of it even in the depths of the sea. And this, this nugget of value out here in space has people on it and they're the ones that are now deciding its future with our new talk technology, with internet, and with the, the, with the international web, and so many different things. We can talk instantly to people all over the world. It's mind-boggling. Most people are again wondering, what's, what's life all about? Well now, before we go into that, though, again, I want to bring out the fact that there are two ways of looking at this. There is the physical planet with all of its wealth, and then there is the world of mind and spirit. Well, I, I have many experts that I've been in touch with. I was talking with one woman not long ago who feels that she's been in touch with people from other dimensions of reality. And you go down the street and you find the person with the tarot card who will predict your fortune because they're in touch with other worlds. And of course, this has been exposed as fake and just in a recent article in Reader's Digest. So the average person wondering about all of this, and then they go to church and they, they, they are told about heaven and about Jesus. And as I say that, I want to come out front here with the fact that while I still recognize that my Christian belief is a, just an hypothesis, it's, uh, we, we, we have a new uh, word that is very useful in trying to understand these things, and this is from our digital age. It's called the icon. You go to your computer and you see a little picture of something, and you click onto it because it symbolizes a lot more. Well, there's two ways of thinking about Jesus, the, the story of the, of the manger and of his death and ascension and all the rest. We can view it as a myth, which has beautiful symbology, symbol, sim, symbolism. And on the other hand, we know that uh, many times the myths uh, from the past are, were based on a true story. So whether you think of it as a true story or as a symbolic story, there's no question but what the 
idea of Jesus and his love and his forgiveness and his compassion and his uh, revelation of a supreme being that was like a heavenly father. This has guided people through the centuries that have been responsible for the best things right here on planet Earth. In fact, I would say to those who are zealous for their religion, the best way to prove and its value is to demonstrate it in your actions by taking action that will eliminate pollution and poverty and bring justice into our human society. Actually, I have talked with great experts who have uh, confirmed that with the present wealth of knowledge and the materials that we have today, there's no excuse for poverty. And here we find one person having billions of dollars and millions of people not even making ten dollars a day. Some places not even a dollar a day. And there, there, there's actual hunger and uh, deprivation. There's so many people they can't find any meaning in their life because it's so miserable. And there's no excuse for that. If the people who care and who know would come together as trustees of Earth, this next millennium could be an Earth trustee millennium. And all over the world we would see the rejuvenation of Earth. And we would see opportunity for a child, for a babe in a mother's arms to grow up and enjoy this wonderful life. And learn about great music and a great art and see the good things of life and have relationships of friendship and of love that would enrich their life. And then who knows what will be beyond this life. Again, I've talked with many Nobel laureates. We have 33 Nobel laureates as sponsors of Earth Day. And the brightest people the more they learn, the more mystery. And here at this time of the winter solstice, the last solstice before the new millennium, reminding us in early history how people reaching out for love for God, they were afraid that the light would disappear and there would just be darkness. And then on this wonderful occasion, the days would start getting longer and there would be the renewal of life. Isaac Asimov, who was one of our Earth Day sponsors, said that on Earth Day at the United Nations, you know, we ring the peace bell, the moment spring begins. And he said, this is such a beautiful symbol of what life is all about because spring is the moment of renewal of life. This is when the new springs, when the new plants come, start to come out. And this is the renewal of life. And the human family needs renewal. They re need renew rejuvenation. And anyone who hears my words, make a decision right now that you're going to be a trustee of Earth. And whether it's seeking through your Christian walk or through your belief to be fair and just, or whether it's going out and planting a tree, or cleaning up in your neighborhood, or helping someone who has been impoverished or is crippled or is blind or is in trouble, the more we can spread the compassion that was demonstrated so beautifully by Jesus and his followers and by other people. I don't want to leave out the Hindus and the Buddhists and, and the Muslims and the Jews who have reached out in this mystery to find something that they could hold within and that would deepen their relationships with people and places around them. Let's do all we can to make the new millennium an Earth trustee millennium. And when March 20 comes around, 
and we celebrate Earth Day all over the planet. When we ring the peace bell at the United Nations, here in New York and in Vienna and in Japan and in other places, maybe bells will ring all over the world. Sky, we were talking about Earth Day and the Earth Trustee agenda and some of its history, and I thought that giving a background from my youth on would help to show where I'm coming from. Uh, I was fascinated years ago by the work of Hayakawa. He wrote a book called Tyranny of Words. I knew him, and we used to talk out in San Francisco. I remember visiting him at his home. And uh, the difficulty in communication is that, of course, we have different languages, for one thing, when we're trying to communicate globally, but everybody comes with a different meaning, different view of words, because depending on their culture, uh, depending on uh, their, their sex or their history. And uh, people will respond with warmth and really pay attention to some words that register with them. Another person will respond with another word. Well, now, with that little preliminary, let me go back and try to give you an understanding of why I think and do what I do based on my history. Again, I'm 84 years old. I was born in Davis City, Iowa in 1915. My father was an evangelist. I showed you a picture of him traveling around the country. And in my early youth, I was uh, told that I was very inquisitive. And parents encourage your children to be inquisitive. Uh, that's a good trait. Uh, the, and not only that, but we should, li we should listen inwardly for what we discover that's important and try to save it and use it and relate to it. Anyway, uh, in my early youth, we traveled all over the country. Uh, my, uh, I was the eldest of six children, and uh, I had amazing experiences of just to cite one. When I was uh, four or five years old out in Wyoming, my father was preaching on the street, and uh, he um, and uh, people that gathered around, uh, they saw me standing there. I was just a five-year-old, and they tossed some coins, a nickel or dime or something, to me. And, and I got excited and picked them up. And other people laughed and tossed money. And so pretty soon I had my hands full of coins. Well, the fascinating thing about this, explain it as you will. I know it's true. Don't believe me if you won't, don't want to. but. My mother had had a dream a couple of nights before that in which she saw us having a street meeting and me picking up coins off the street. And she says, and he picked up, and I've forgotten the amount, but let's say uh, $15 and three cents. We counted the coins and it was $15 and three cents. It was the exact time, amount that she had seen in her dream. So. We live in a life where there are mysteries. I've talked about such things to psychic, well, uh, for example, in one case, uh, a man by the name of Daisley out in California uh, is um, a so-called psychic. I don't care much about psychics. I think there's an awful lot of fraud in so-called, in their paranormal abilities and so on. But I can tell you this, that, uh, I happened to be speaking at a church in Santa Barbara many years ago, and I, I mentioned that, uh, uh, that I was interested in uh, strange phenomena about people who had died, that I had known Bishop Pike. He was a famous Episcopal bishop. and. Uh, his, he, I had met him in New York City uh, on the 
uh, when he was visiting there, I'd gone to his hotel room and he'd mentioned that his son was in the other room, but he was asleep. Well, a few days after that, the front page of the New York Times had a story about his son committing suicide. And uh, the, the, what happened at that time, I don't know what the explanation is, but I know what happened. That night, I was wakened up by a, a dream or something. I just couldn't imagine what it was. And I hear, uh, while I was awake, I started in crying and praying. I prayed, I was praying for somebody who had just died. And I, I couldn't imagine what this was all about. And, and that morning when I got up and went down the elevator, a woman on the elevator who was a friend of mine, I said, you know, I have the strangest experience. And I told her, she said, well, that's weird. I had a similar experience. I, uh, she said, I was wakened up in the middle of the night and I ran to the door and here I opened the door and there was a terrible apparition there in front of me. And she said, I, I closed the door and then I woke up. But it was such a real dream that it, it frightened me. And I, I said, well, how strange. Well, it so turned out that that night was the night that Bishop Pike's son committed suicide in London. And this woman, who had also had an experience, she had called a, 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 an old friend of hers that she'd been out of touch with to tell her about this strange experience. Now what made this amazing was her friend was a girlfriend of the boy who had committed suicide. So these strange things that happen in our life make us real, make us realize that there must be some other dimension of reality. But my experience again has been that every expert I've talked to in that field has come up with an explanation that contradicts explanations of other people in that field. There are people who talk about a third dimension, a fourth dimension, a fifth dimension. My advice to you is, whatever you feel or view about these things, let what happens to you in this life, this real life that we all admit exists, let what happens in this life determine the value of what you think about other other dimensions of reality. And I, I would add to that my own, again, my own Christian conviction. While it is an, a, a, a hypothesis that cannot be proven, I don't understand why it's still such a mystery. It seems to me it would be very simple for Jesus to come back and have a press conference at the United Nations and to let the whole world know what other dimensions of reality are like. They must exist, but we live in a two-dimensional reality, the real world we all agree on, and other dimensions that we have lots of differences about. I had an amazing conversation with the Dalai Lama. I was flown over to Budapest to receive an award and be made a member of the Club of Budapest. And the other person on the platform with me was the Dalai Lama. We had a conversation afterwards. And I said, I, I so admire what you have done in your efforts for your country and your efforts for peace and for the environment. And I said at the same time, I, I want to mention to you that I don't agree with your religion. You know, he's a Buddhist and of course he has the Buddhist hypothesis or view of what is beyond this physical world. And I happen to have the Christian hypothesis and other people have Hindu or, uh, well, have uh, uh, other beliefs. But again, if it's helping you in this life, fine. But the real test of its value, in my mind, as far as 
other people are concerned and your relationships to other people is concerned and what happens to the United Nations and in the world at large depends on how we apply the values and the, the, the feelings. Uh, I know reading again relating to Christian life, I, I believe whether it's Billy Graham or whether it's great evangelists of, of the past, they recognize that a strange thing happens at times when they feel an anointing. It seems like there's something from another dimension that is getting into their words and into their expression of their faith and uh, that they communicate more effectively through the feeling than just through the words. So our semantics may be different, but we know the power of love. And that is the great truth that needs to be shared all over the world in the new millennium. Okay, uh, today is right after the winter solstice, and this is just before the new millennium, a uh, very auspicious time. And I try to get attention by the Secretary General to ring the peace bell on this anniversary of the first Minute for Peace. Back in 1963, we ended the period of mourning for President Kennedy with a Minute for Peace, which was carried by radio all over the world. And here was a chance to give people a sense of identity with the whole human family. Well, anyway, I tried to get the attention of the Secretary General on this, and I talked to one of the secretaries there, um, Ms. Shi Yun from China, who tried very hard to do something with this. And I said, as you will see from the next page, today is the anniversary of the first Minute for Peace. Calling attention to this Minute for Peace Day can further the Minute for Peace idea. The fact that it is the last solstice before 2000 is symbolic. In early history, they feared the days would keep getting shorter until there were no more days. The solstice began longer days and was a time of rejoicing. And now we could use it as hope for the new millennium. your children will grow up in a new future that offers promise and hope. God bless you all. And uh, you could say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there we go.